Indonesia cancelled all military cooperation with Australia this week as the two regional powers look set to bash heads yet again. Naturally, many wondered if this could be the start of military action between the two countries. But could Indonesia really pose a threat to Australia? Well no, and the notion of an Indonesian invasion is ridiculous, being described by the former Indonesian president as preposterous. Even this week, the Indonesian Armed Forces Chief General called his Australian counterpart his best friend. Indeed, while politically Indonesia and Australia are sometimes very much at odds, the human person-to-person -person connections of both militaries are generally very positive. Generals and admirals from both countries regularly dine with each other and a great respect is afforded among their troops. The Indonesian Special Forces are even trained in Perth by the Australian SAS, which is incidentally where this incident arose from. But this rivalry, which has seen direct and indirect military action in the 1960s and in 1999, with 19 Australian casualties and hundreds of Indonesian casualties has a lot of salience for people. So let's entertain the scenario for a second. Indonesia has a population of 250 million, which dwarfs Australia's population of only 24 million, and its armed forces have 400,000 troops, much larger than the 100,000 active and reserve troops Australia can draw from, with only about half of those being active duty soldiers, sailors and airmen. Even though bigger army diplomacy should work for them, the problem for Indonesia is that invading Australia would be like Cleopatra trying to invade England. They have no logistical capability of traversing the sea between them. In fact, they lack the naval capability to reliably traverse the waters of their own nation. They also lack ships like HMAS Canberra and HMAS Adelaide which can transport thousands of soldiers, tons of cargo and lots of aircraft. 400,000 troops is a big number, but they're harmless if they can't find you. Even their air force is composed of Australian hand-me-downs like four C-130s which were gifted in 2011, and years later more Hercules aircraft were this time sold to what the Australians described as mates rates to Indonesia. They also lack air to air refuelling capacity, which would be required to get their troops to the southern parts of Australia where the people and nice things are. Australia does not lack this capacity and is actually the party responsible for all the air to air refuelling in Syria. What the Australians lack in numbers, they make up for in money. Australia just spent $50 billion buying a new fleet of long range submarines, and is spending tens of billions making a new fleet of Hobart class destroyers. This is on top of a military budget of $23 billion US dollars, with Indonesia's only being $8 billion. And this spending is forecast almost double over the next decade, as Australia undergoes what has been described as one of the biggest naval expansions since World War II. But let's take the Indonesians' naval inability to move thousands of troops and take Australia's air and naval superiority out of the question, and pretend Indonesia magically landed soldiers on the Australian coast. What then? Well, they'll surely die of starvation, or give up. Most of Australia's population is located far from the reach of a marching Indonesian army an army that would have to traverse thousands and thousands of kilometres of inhospitable terrain that is extremely hot during the day and much much colder than an Indonesian winter at night. There's no water, there are really no towns to pillage, and the roads that aren't dirt tracks are only very simple and can't land heavy aircraft, and the animals would be annoying at best and deadly at worst. In fact, you could say the biggest reason why an Indonesian invasion, or frankly any invasion of Australia would fail, is not because of its military, but the fact that even to one of its closest neighbours, it's still too far away.